All right, we're here. It's almost the end of 2022. Uh, we're having a historical NFT roundtable for collectors. I know that's a, a huge mouthful to say. I'm sitting here with Adam McBride, Irish Gal, and Zero G. We're going to reflect on what was 2022. As we were discussing even before we started recording, there's so much that's happened this year. It feels like it was four years ago, man. We, I think the, the historical community found their divide. There was tons of projects that were rediscovered, um, but I'm excited to talk with all of them to really reflect uh, throughout this year, my own personal journey. Uh, when I started covering historical NFTs, uh, most of the episodes has been primarily just OG creators and teams and organizations and DAOs. Here we get to bring in all the collectors to kind of... Uh, end the year with a with a different mindset and then towards the end of the conversation we will think about what may happen next year more rediscoveries more more fights more infrastructure who really knows i'm excited so uh everybody thank you for joining me uh this morning and afternoon for for irish gal just for me (laughs) thank you so much (laughs) yeah this is going to be uh very exciting so you know i want to keep this pretty much open format uh, because, again, we're dissecting now 12 months of, of epicness. Uh, I'll share my screen here in a little bit, and we could cover some of my calendars. Of course, here, I'm going to get to show my own bags and my own timelines because uh, that's kind of how it works in this space. Uh, but first, we'll, we'll discuss. I'll start here with, with Irish Gal. Uh, Irish Gal, you are a leader in the, the Crypto Schools community. You know, you host some of the women's spaces. You're you have a, a V1 Punk shirt on, which I don't know if they could see through the the video right now. Uh, tell us a little bit about your story. I've had Adam and Zero G on for individual episodes. Uh, for those that aren't familiar with you, tell us first a little bit about your pre-crypto history and then how you found your way into the schools and V1 Punk community. Yeah, good question. Um, so I'll go back as far as like university. Um, I studied creative digital media. Actually, I went originally to study computer science um, and I did that for a while. I dropped out, realized I was missing the creativity, missing something to do with that. Um, and not a huge fan of coding either. So God knows why I, why I joined that. Um, after graduating from creative digital media, um, I realized I really loved anything to do with visual design. I loved anything to do with marketing, social media. Um, and I just didn't know exactly what it is that I wanted to specialize in. So I actually tried everything. I set up my own um, like media agency where I did website design, UX design, uh, graphics and social media management. And I was like, a one one man show uh, doing everything and it led me to become very overwhelmed, really stressed out, burned out a ton of times and he obviously needed to hire people, but I didn't. I wanted to do everything myself, very like attached to things. Um, and I, yeah, found NFTs actually through TikTok, would you believe it? Uh, through watching videos on TikTok, yeah, from covid a lot of extra time spent and um, I began my journey even with painting um, and found a love of painting through that. Um, with crypto exactly was actually found out and started investing because of my brother. He was getting paid in Bitcoin in his job. And I think he was like the first person or like first company in Ireland that was actually getting paid in Bitcoin years ago. And I thought it was really amazing. So I started Bitcoin was the first thing that I got into. And then I kind of said, there has to be more than just this. You know, it's not going to be the only thing that I'm going to invest in. And I started looking at all these like altcoins, everything else. And they interested me a hell of a lot more than Bitcoin did. I never really got too attached to that. Um, And yeah, just started learning more and more about that. And then got really interested in that you could make profit from this and then started learning a little bit more about um, about like shares and stuff because I just never knew. I, I didn't even do business for my leave insert. I didn't do anything like that, which is, you know, like everything was completely new to me. So it was really interesting. Um, and yeah, I just had to do, learn kind of everything else done by myself. 
Yeah, no, no kidding. I'm a similar uh, trajectory. I didn't have any financial background through college or anything. I found Ethereum first, but it's always the shit coins that gets everybody really into this <laughs> into, into this space. Uh, and then we'll discuss. I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about crypto schools since that was um, a very controversial moment, but it's brought a lot of uh, greatness into historical NFTs. Uh, one cool common uh, trait for all of us is we're all actually uh, media hosts within the historical community. Zero G has exploring uh, vintage NFTs. Adam McBride, of course, with the first historical NFT podcast in 2021, the Adam McBride Show, and Irish Gal hosts some of the crypto school spaces as well and the the women NFT spaces. Uh, Zero G, uh, you started your podcast. We discussed it even before you started on kind of the direction you wanted to go. Third one to enter the space. Tell us a little bit about your reflection um, of interviewing uh, a lot of these counterparty OGs and then diving into the Pepe community. Of course, as I don't know, Zero G is also one of the top collectors uh, within HNFTs. This guy has a massive collection that I'm very envious of, and I think many people are too. Oh, thanks. Yeah, you know, I've been reflecting on on my experience this uh, you know this past year talking to all of these artists and project founders. And to me, it's been really, uh, it's been really amazing in, in being able to like, one of the things that I, I've noticed is, is a common trait amongst all of them is they've had a, they've had a vision in the, and for the most part, are all, all really forward looking. Um, I mean, I have a tremendous respect for, for all these people that, you know, they they were building and creating when it wasn't sexy to do that, you know, where there was no no one was paying attention other than these small internet communities. So, um, yeah, I, I'm really um, I'm really amazed. You know, it gave me an even greater appreciation for for some of the things that um, you know that we we're out here collecting and diving into for sure. And and zero G's got the the longest form podcast two uh, two hours or more for for most of them. So if you need a good listen. Um, and you need some good background music or noise, definitely uh, tune into them. Adam McBride, uh, he's probably rammed through everybody to interview already, at least all of the the iconic legends. Um, but this year you all, you turned and you started hosting Twitter Spaces, a little bit of a different format from a podcast uh, with, with Leonidas and NFT Now and White Rabbit. Uh, tell us about your reflection of moving from podcasting to Twitter Spaces and like what kind of impact that's had on for the community. Yeah, honest. To be honest, I'm not sure Twitter Spaces is is in any way better than podcasts. I think it's actually probably a lot worse. <laughs> um, I think podcasts have a life, uh, a, like kind of I, I would call it like an evergreen life. If you're a digital media uh, person, you know what I'm talking about. But it's like the Twitter Spaces are so in the moment now that I think unfortunately what they do is they get they get lost to time in an instant, right? And you know, fortunately, I've, I've I've downloaded and saved all the ones that I've you know had access to. But even still, it doesn't give that kind of long life that a podcast has. Um, so I think they're a bit unfortunate. I mean, I know they're the kind of thing of the now, but I look at it as like when this next wave hits and the wave after that and the wave after that. Um, you know, ten years, fifteen years down the road, how are we going to tell this story of historic NFTs and and you know, the people who are sitting in this, who are on this podcast right now, like we're the ones because we have this kind of media bend where we actually get to craft that to a degree. Um, and I think that Twitter spaces, unfortunately, aren't the best way to do that. Uh, I do think, you know, podcasts, long form video, uh, long podcasts like Zero G is doing actually are the things that are going to have more long term value. Um, that said, I don't regret doing the Twitter spaces and I love kind of live format. Um, is very comfortable for me and I, I definitely enjoy it and appreciate it. And we've got to talk to amazing people. It's a blessing, right? Um, but I think to kind of te teach the next group of people and the next group of people and, and on and on, um, we have to really branch out to other forms of media, uh, which have much longer lives. That That's my current kind of view. Yeah, this is this is something that we've discussed and we discuss on end with with Emblem Vault, which I'm sure we'll talk about uh, later too. You begin to start noticing kind of the differences in the communities between the historical community and what's called the modern community, which is uh, you know late 2020 or early 2021 and beyond. Our community is pretty much full of collectors, and collectors like to move 
at snail space, right? It's not, it's not about the, 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 the hype marketing that you see within Yuga Labs and, and some of these other collections. For us, it's all about uh, crafting the story and the, and the narrative and being able to uh, pitch that in the right type of medium. Uh, we've learned that as a quote unquote influence, which is cringe to even say, the way to gain credibility in the space um, is kind of just like showing off your intellect, right? It's not showing off the type of community, creating timelines, uh, putting out media, um, putting out thought pieces, you know, uh, maybe even getting in some uh, intellectual arguments or debates on Twitter, right? Showing off kind of where that, uh, where that divide is or where your philosophical view is. Um, I think most of us has begun growing um, as leaders, what would you guys say um, are proper traits and pop, proper uh, leadership uh, capabilities that somebody needs to possess um, as a historical community, um, as a historical leaders? And uh, kind of we'll just have a discussion of like, where do we think the community needs to go so that we could kind of get out of our own echo bubble? I think integrity is the, is the biggest deal. So we have, um, we, you know, that's something that we've, you know, and this isn't strictly just in the modern NFT scene. You know, there's been elements of that in the historic scene and also in crypto in general. We've seen all these crazy um, scandals. But, you know, if you don't maintain your integrity throughout this, then, you know, the Internet never forgets. And it's just really a better way to live your life. So um, I suspect that, you know, over time, you know, especially for collectors, you know, they're not looking at the latest flash in the pan, you know, they're really going to dive in and, and get a better understanding and a better awareness of the scene. So I think integrity is, um, you know, is going to be one of the biggest qualities going forward to to maintain relevancy. Okay. How about, how about you, Irish guy? What, what, do you, what do you think? I completely agree. Yeah. Um, I think, Number one tip would be like, don't become a shit poster, become an educator. There's a huge <laughs> difference between the two. Um, like Adam yourself, I definitely see you as an educator, you know, shit poster, I could name so many. And there are people as well that I wouldn't necessarily want to interview. And um, there are people that um, are there trying to get more followers and don't really care about lying to the community. I think yeah, uh, you definitely shouldn't be lying, you know, publicly. It doesn't it doesn't represent you very well or the, the other communities that you hold NFTs from. You know, everyone is representative of some community, whether or not you're a leader or whether or not you're like a moderator, that doesn't matter. Um, especially if you like your PFP is representing a certain NFT project. If you're like a bad person, it's very transparent. Like that's what I love about NFTs. And I think a lot of people don't understand like how transparent you can see true people um, through a tweet or true, yeah, like just even if it's Discord. So it's like day-to-day -day communication. I think people need to be a little bit more mindful. Um, a lot of like even artists go into, like they're artists because, like a lot of artists get into creativity because they need that to like mentally escape. Like that's definitely something that I needed. I felt like I needed to be, to do something creative or else like I'd go crazy. So a lot of people have like, you know, have um like what way would I say it um they they kind of need like you need either like feedback from other people and whether it's good whether it's bad that's okay but I think people just need to be a little bit more mindful especially like you hear of like uh, strangers or like uh uh, keyboard warriors like there is a lot of them and <laughs> just because they're anonymous type of thing people I think are a bit more brave that way um, if they a bit? If they're not <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I, I posted a, a tweet as probably about a week ago maybe I'll pull it up later um, it, there was a, a DAO call that I was in and uh, the topic of historical NFTs and the community came up and uh, the most common one was like, man, that community is very grumpy. Every time I interact with them, I, I could feel their anger. So, so Adam, how, how do we like get out of that kind of anger bubble or what, like, what do you think uh, the, in, the leaders and some of the, the upcoming leaders in the HNFT space need to possess so that we uh, move past our grumpiness? It's very difficult, to be honest, because we live in an algorithm-driven social media environment. It's really, really difficult um, for creators who want to see their work, artists especially, who want to see their work in, in as many as many eyeballs in front of it as possible. 
it's really hard when you wreck it. It doesn't take but a couple of days to recognize that negativity and combativeness gives you the most interactions of anything on these platforms. And it's really unfortunate, but that's kind of where we live right now. So it's really, it, it's difficult. And I, I give a lot of leeway to people. You know, I've seen friends of mine, personal friends, make go down roads of negativity, calling stuff BS and stuff like that because it like it got them their most like their most favorited their most shared tweet ever and then they're like it's like a it's like a rat you know with that pellet of crack you know it's just like oh i get it again oh i get it again and it's really hard you know i've been in social media for a decade now and i realize the difficulty it is as as an individual because you want to be heard you know you want to make an impact and it's difficult not to go down that road so i tr- i try to be you know just you know, forgiving to myself and others who've maybe gone off the path a little bit and come back because it's hard. And um, so in the historic space, man, we're so we're so new. This is like the thing. I mean, it's it's like we are literally I, I would say we're like step one. Right. You know, give ourselves some some credit for being here early. Right. We're all going to be early and, you know, just try to provide value. But understand that, like, it's hard, man. I mean, you guys know it's hard. You guys put out podcasts, <laughs> right? I put out podcasts. I put out podcasts, right? And how many likes do you get? How many shares do you get about a cool podcast with somebody who was an innovator in 2015 and you get five retweets and 10 likes? Mm-hmm. And it's like, wow, how do I make an impact here? How do I reach more people? And all I can say is you got to be patient. You just have to be really, really patient and be in it for the long long haul because there is no other way. Uh, the other way is to go, you know, to that dark side of like f- farming engagement and all that sort of stuff. And I don't think there's anybody who thinks that that's a, a viable long-term strategy. Yeah. <clears throat> when you, when you look at kind of like the, the newer shit posters, like thread guy who I've had on the podcast, right. You, he's tweeting 300 times a day, which I don't think something, I don't think that's something that the community that, collects, you know, old JPEGs is really interested in, you know, you only need to post a few tweets a day, but they have to be really effective. So it's really kind of like trying to find that medium. But on on the other side too, you, we also want to try to bring in some of those modern properties from those, the people who have those large followings, right? We, either we go out and grow and interview different people, or, you know, we try to bring some of our ship posting antics or some of their ship posting antics over, uh, but try to turn that into historical uh, or curate in that curate that in a historical manner. Uh, although sometimes that I've tried to ship post um, with a historical emphasis, it's fallen on dumb fears or uh, the the sarcasm is not uh, <laughs> the, the the sarcastic nature of it uh, is not uh, consumed in the way that it was originally uh, intent intended. It's quite interested, but uh, can and, stay- and it's really difficult, right? Like if you want to have a voice a little bit outside, say you want to come and kind of commentary on crypto right? Even that is not rewarded, right? These algorithms just reward you for being in this like super slim niche. That's it. Right. And so it's a constant challenge. And, uh, you know, one we've talked about a lot, I- I'd love to hear, you know, Irish and, and zero G's kind of point on this as well. Like what is the strategy? You know, you want to have reach, but do you want to niche yourself down so tight that you literally can't move out of that niche, I, especially Irish girl, since you've been into it a while, like what your view on that is. I think, I think Adam, I think we need a lot more historical memes for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to have more fun. Yeah. A hundred percent. And you can still have fun without being this chip poster, you know? Um, but yeah, we need more, um, I think educational tweets um, and threads obviously work um, really well in terms of like, I think if people bookmark your tweets and then share it, let's say, um, in a DM, I think it does help the algorithm a lot. I think it does recognize like little things like that because you're spending longer in order, like you're spending longer um, on that tweet rather than still scrolling. So the algorithm is learning that way. And I always hear like the algorithm doesn't give up on you. So why would you like, let's say you only get two likes or whatever, 10 likes, let's say on a tweet. And you're like, well, that must be rubbish because it didn't, you didn't like feed the algorithm. and didn't do well. They say like, still never delete anything. Um, You would be surprised um, 
it can still do quite well. Um, like it's like between like the I think it's twenty four hours really. They say like forty eight hours, but it's really only like within the first day that it will do. And as Adam said like earlier, that on Twitter like it things do get lost. Like if you don't bookmark something, it's impossible nearly to find something from like a week ago even. So it is important to use like other platforms as well to broaden your reach, especially if you're not doing any like paid ads. And most people in NFTs wouldn't be in paid ads because it really doesn't work. We're so like security or uh, like aware right now that to not click links. So it's like against really that that Web3 ethos, I think, to to do paid advertisements um, in for Twitter, like Twitter solely. Um, but yeah, like I use other platforms, like I use TikTok, I use YouTube, and um, they can do tremendously better than Twitter. So for that reason, like you have to, you have to be everywhere, unfortunately, and it is really time consuming. But it it, it is something that you need to do, especially as an artist, um, or especially as like I think an educator, you need to be, yeah, you need you need to have like long term footage. You need to have something that's like easily searchable. For like SEO purposes, if it's your website, you need to have um, widespread like communication. Yeah. yeah, I think there's there's a real opportunity for other people in the HNFT space who are looking to provide value or get involved, um, providing these different forms of content, whether you're good at TikTok or uh, YouTube or whatever, or just blog post writing, right? But providing that value um, to the community will be rewarded but you have to be in it for the like you can't just think you're going to come in for a month and just pop in and you know hit it it's just not going to happen yeah when you when you look at uh when you look at like we'll say the first two classes so the the historical class of 2021 leaders it was really just adam white rabbit and leonidas i guess you would say is a three and then i guess in this class right it's like me zero g irish gal you see Mifiko with the post, right? You have Chain Left, you have a Black Star. There's a handful of people who stepped up and started providing different kind of types of content. So it makes me wonder, like, who's going to be the class next year? Is it going to be the people who uh, are are just come in and just start swinging with a, a lot of money, and then that's kind of how you you gain, gain your credibility? That's what you see with like the PFP movements: people who just come in and spend 500 ETH and they just gain all these different followers. Um, it's interesting to, to think of like what the trends will be. Um, so let's just uh, dive on to that. Uh, and we'll start with zero G is as we move into 2023, um, and we'll bounce around through this conversation. Uh, what, what do you think will be the trends for historical NFTs? What, what do you think we'll, we'll see? Is there going to be some types of improvement and what type of, uh, capabilities or what type of content, um, do you think some of these, these new leaders, um, will engage in? Well, I, I think the the at least the way that I'm focusing on it is in, is also kind of to what Adam was saying is that you know is basically taking a long view on this. I don't think this bear market's going to stop anytime soon. I don't think it's going to we're going to get out of this in six months. Probably not even a year, maybe even two years. So, and the other thing I, I think people even in the historic space take for granted as an assumption is that historic NFTs will boom at the same time that that either crypto or or normie you know new mints boom i like we could actually miss a bull cycle with the rest of like go out of phase with the rest of the market too so i think um so i'm just focusing on the um uh, on continuing to focus on like adam was saying like documenting and, and and building value for future people that are coming into the space to learn and to uh, and to just find out what they like and what it's all about. So I, I guess um, we'll. St I guess what I would hope is that there's uh, at least during this bear, there's less of a focus on on like prices, you know, and more on the like what makes this stuff special, right? Because I see a lot of some of the new people are like they're only coming in here strictly as an investment. And you're kind of, you know, you're missing the point to an extent, but also. If everyone is just coming in to to flip on each other, then there's no there's not going to be the organic or even inorganic price growth that you're anticipating. If everyone's just playing hot potato, then you know. Wait, you've just described the art world, <laughs> <laughs> right? Right. Uh, if, if 
if we want that hockey stick growth, but right now everyone is playing hot potato. Uh, so, so Adam, then I guess, uh, I'm sure a lot of, uh, upcoming or, or inspired people in the community who want to, uh, grow their audience or become a leader. I'm listening to this. I have a, you know, a small to moderate audience. I want to be part of the historical NFT leading class of 2023. Uh, what should I, what, what, what would you recommend they should do to, to help grow that audience and step up? It's, it's hard, right? I mean, this is what we are all trying to do at the same time. And it's really hard. I mean, my, my current strategy for myself, and we've talked about this a lot is kind of mixing why the the past projects are important, um, goes into the future because without the, if there's no future in blockchain and, and digital collectibles, it, they won't be mad. They'll be worthless. Right. Uh, we have to tie the future of what we all envision with this like web three future to the pieces in the past and make this connection. And uh, I'm not saying I figured it out because it's really hard, but telling that story of why it's important um, along with the impact those projects made, like the obvious ones like Pepe's, right? Why Pepe's are this like critical moment in time when something was done in a different way and why that matters, right? why they're now, I don't know, I think Leo put it out the other day, there's, you know, 400,000 NFT projects this past year, right? Or some crazy hundreds of thousands, right? And why that matters that that these first ones, well, there were only, I don't know, 25 in 2017. Like, why is that incredible that those ones were done back then? Why why are those unique stories interesting? Um, I think that's, that's the kind of, that's the key. It's just... It, you know, every one of us is going to tell that story in a different way. And the reality is, is that new collectors coming into the space are done one at a time. And it's done with one TikTok brings in, you know, mm -hmm. one person who saw a TikTok and they somehow enter the NFT space. That's the way I see actually social social media kind of moving in the future. Um, it's not necessarily about followers. It's about really interesting con uh, content that grabs people's attention. And, uh, we all know how hard that is to do, but that's that's really what has to happen. And the reality is we're probably all old goats here <laughs> and we won't be the ones. It'll be some kid who's 13 who finds historical NFTs and he knows how to do TikTok right and he knows how to do YouTube right. And he's the one who brings in a million people, but he probably will learn it from one of us. And so it's a, it's a fantastic opportunity that I'm excited about to kind of be one of these old, old guys doing this sort of stuff. But you know, that's just kind of the way it happens. You know, this kind of social media growth and the way historic NFTs are going to grow. None of us really knows, but it's fun to tell these stories. Yeah, we're, we are kind of the old geezers, right? We're going to be, <laughs> we're, we will we will be rediscovered at some point in time by the by the 13-year-old TikToker. Uh, it's funny, I don't know who tweeted me or I had a conversation the other day on Twitter is like, are some of these going to be, some of these NFT projects that we've already talked about going to be rediscovered in five years, like another rediscovery on the rediscovery. And I think that's totally possible, like <laughs> totally possible. Like some gamer community of they're playing Minecraft and they're like, I like whatever, you know, I like, uh, I don't know, either waifu, right? It just comes from We like them and they're going to be our PFPs. And like all of a sudden that project becomes like known to a whole new community and they just decide these are going to be our PFPs. We're going to go kind of resurrect this. And those PFPs are going to now be valuable because this whole new group of community of who are already kind of built in community decide that this NFT project is going to be the one we like. And uh, I think that's super exciting. All right. So speaking of uh, valuing projects, the historical community, we, we started at the beginning of the year with uh, the discovery it's not even a rediscovery, a discovery of, of puny codes that was posted by Devoted. And then we ended, uh, I think with Lenaji was like the last one, or there might've been the, the angel battles that you posted. How has uh, your perspective of valuing these historical assets changed from, from discovering this like name coin wave, which we'll talk about. I'm sure everyone wants to hear us talk about that, you know, to the crypto schools thing of 2019, to the timeline, to the dates changing, the timelines perspective. Uh, we'll start with, with zero G. How, how, how have you changed over this last year um, from valuing uh, the, these old JPEGs or tokens? 
Well, I, I've gotten a much greater understanding of of Namecoin. I mean, I, I was familiar with it before, but I had missed the boat on Twitter eggs until I until the puny code rediscovery. But I've become much more familiar with the um with like Namecoin NFTs and how that works. So I'm I really think that there's um there's a future for a lot of the um for a lot of name coin stuff that, you know, that people are fading right now. But I mean, again, not financial advice, all that stuff. I um I mean, I I think it's been interesting, like when you're talking about the entire year, it's it's like we also had that drama around like the um the F P like we had the merge and then the emergence of that F P O W fork that got like immediately went nowhere and we were all concerned about <laughs> all you know i, I would it's say like that, y2k uh, all over again <laughs> i know right <laughs> i i guess it, um you know i i guess i i've um it's been interesting to see like these you know we haven't had a oh yeah we also had the ipc that's another one that was wow that was <laughs> that was crazy no, I say I, shit show. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, rediscoveries are hard, man. That's all I could say. Rediscoveries are hard. The best laid plans. Yeah. You know, I, well, the way I look at it is um, uh, it's a good story. You know, I <laughs> think what happened. Yeah. But no, I, I think what's been interesting, too, is we've had these I'm looking at what you're sharing, uh, Jake. I mean, um, you know, we had a big year for for V1 crypto punks, too. Um you know, just man, um, you know, some of the Dogecoin stuff getting recognized, the MTM stuff. I mean, there's been a, a tremendous amount. Um, I mean, going on. I, I, I guess I would say that you know we're in the midst of a of a really large drawdown in the crypto space, and it's been really, uh, it's really interesting to see who's staying around for not just crypto but for the historical NFTs too. So you know, I I think it. You know, it just it just goes to show who's um you know who's really like passionate about it versus who is trying to make a you know a quick flip or you know not to say there's not anything wrong with trying to make money but um you know in a super, what is now a super illiquid market um this is not this is not the easiest place to try that yeah, absolutely. And so for those that are listening, I pulled up the part three of my NFT archaeology calendar, which pretty much just covers all the events that had happened. Uh, and this calendar is from December 14, 2021 to July 14, 2022. Uh, the big things that it is missing, which we'll probably discuss is Ether ID, V1, V2. You have the Lenaji rediscovery. There might be a few more things on here. The big focal point, I think this is th this moment kind of like sparked the massive div philosophical divide between we'll call it now the, the historical community and the vintage community uh, irish gal who's a leader within crypto schools at the time at uh, crypto schools on january 11th had 10,206 sales in one day uh, some people still to this day don't consider it historical some people do some people call it og uh, irish gal tell us a little bit about that rediscovery were you around during that time and um where, how do you value crypto schools? Yeah, really good question. Around that time, I actually wasn't like directly uh, with crypto schools. I was, January 11th, I was um, with the V1 Punks team, uh, which was funny enough because they weren't actually meant to like go live the, the rapper as such, but they, they like, they had nobody in the Discord or, you know, they didn't have any followers really whatsoever. They didn't have anyone like looking after a Twitter account or anything. So that's where I kind of came in. Um, but yeah, with, with crypto schools, how I would value the community, uh, like with any community, I would definitely value with the community, like how active it is. Um, definitely they're very active in terms of like, there's two kind of segments of crypto schools. There's the crypto schools DAO and then there's the like the main team that I work with. Um, so the Crypto Schools DAO is like the amount of different things that they do right now for like artists and the amount of different things that they do for, um, I suppose, to like to, to help new people as well. Like in terms of like when they first started 2019, um, like they still haven't they still haven't even launched the game. They're still working on so many different aspects that are yet to be um that are yet to, to go live um so from 2019 to even now 
is a very long time for an NFT project to be so active and it's a very difficult thing to do. Um, but yeah, and around January, January 2022, I think a lot of people heard about crypto schools through obviously like people buying uh, school lords and a school lord was bought by Gary V. I I know the majority of people because I asked them every single day, like, how did you hear about crypto schools? And usually it is either um, some sort of an influencer online. Um, even if you look up on TikTok and you go crypto schools, there's hundreds upon hundreds of videos there. And like these are all, obviously all people that were just like wanted to show off their new NFT wanted to show off what they're like proud of, of, of having in their in their portfolio, you know. Um, but the Skull Lords were massive sales, absolutely uh, massive. I think when Gary V came in, it was um, one that he bought was around, I think, 100K. 100 ETH, yeah. More. yeah. I think it was 100 ETH, yeah. 100 East, yeah. <laughs> that was when East was worth something. <laughs> exactly. I miss those days. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. So, so here's, uh, I pulled up. Um, and so this is again, part three of the ca calendar, the store or the, the crypto schools rediscovery, uh, whatever you want to call it. There's a lot of nuance to it. There's a lot of, a lot of variables. <clears throat> One thing that's definitely true is that it brought in a, a ton of new people to the historical space. Uh, as we, as Adam discussed before, controversy tends to sell. Uh, there was a lot of controversy behind it between, um, Leonidas, who had swept a bunch of them to, at this time, nothing in 2019 was considered historical. I think really outside of outside of autoglyphs, uh, there was also the claim of it being the second 10K PFP, which kind of inspired this early 10K PFP moment movement, which also ended up getting a lot of controversy that surrounded it as well. Uh, so, so Adam is somebody who is, uh, you know, also in crypto schools, but also has talked to pretty much everybody all over the place. Does second 10K PFP even matter? Um, what is the view of 2019 NFTs uh, now looking at it retroactively, literally almost 12 months later? And kind of how, how do you feel about how the historical community has kind of moved past this controversy or maybe hasn't at all? Yeah, maybe maybe not. Maybe it hasn't, <laughs> right? Um, there's still probably some, some bad blood around there. Um, it's almost just this collector mindset, right? And, you know, collectors are always looking for kind of an edge. What's something I can think of before somebody else? And, um, you know, this idea, I think, you know, the reason it resonated was the idea of 10K PFP. We were all playing in that kind of sandbox where everybody's buying and selling 10K PFPs. But nobody had really explored the idea of, well, what, what, I mean, we, we talk about, you know, punks is the first one, but what was the next one? And nobody had really explored that. And I think it, it vibed with people because of that reason. It was like, oh, well, here's the second one. And people were like, what? It kind of like was something so obvious yet hadn't been explored. And that was the moment where it was like, it was explored. And, you know, the value of it, like the value of anything, it's up to the individual and how these kind of communities and, and collectors kind of view stuff long term. Who knows? Um, but certainly in that moment, it ticked a box. Like holy, sh holy shit, we're we've been playing around for the last six months as everything's PFP, everything is 10K, and nobody had explored that historic aspect of it. And I think that's why it resonated so massively. I mean, it was massive. Um, and, you know, I, you know, part of me, I, and I've had this discussion with multiple people, multiple collectors, you know, are we all going to look back if web three is what we think it's going to be, if digital collectors collectibles are what we believe it's going to be, is everything from 2018, everything from 2019 going to have this kind of bend to it? Um, and that's a possibility. Uh, yeah. There are hundreds of projects in 2018. Don't know how many in 2019. You know, but will they all have this bend? I, I don't, you know, it's, I can't say it's not possible. It's possible. Um, we'll just have to see how that plays out. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know where the tweet is, but Leonidas actually uh, responded to, to one of my questions. I was asking like how many uh, 2018, 2019 projects existed. He said through his own 
research, there's about 2,000 NFT like contracts deployed in 2018 and about 3,000 in 2019, which I thought 2019 was going to actually be like exponentially more. I was really surprised maybe because it was really like that dead period in crypto. So, you know, there really is that that opportunity. I think we're starting to see that some of the 2019 things that are popping up are 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 category based we're starting to see this like yeah we're getting the gen the gen art stuff is definitely like on the radar right the like gen art the ai art of 20 of 2019 those are the two classes that really took off uh with with uh, deep black and then you have some of the gen ones like uh things like clee 2 and uh some of the the variety ones people are beginning to explore and then is if, if when you start realizing this and noticing this you begin realizing that you know maybe the, this is like what where the future of historical NFTs are migrating towards now that, you know, the years the the foundation of timestamps has been explored, been collected. It's been kind of beaten to death in this, you know, philosophical arena. Now we're going to try to look for kind of like these these early projects for these early emerging classifications, you know, whether it's like music NFTs or gen art or social tokens or or whatever it may be. Um, as we move, as we begin to move down the, this timeline, um, through this like rediscovery process, um, something I, I began to notice and kind of moving out of that, like timestamp is kind of this like a uh, commodification, or you could say like a more professionalized version of, uh, of rediscoveries. And I noticed that every new rediscovery is brought more anger, more frustration, more controversy, and it's happening much faster every single time. Why, who, whoever um, feels uh, most apt to talk about this, why do we think this is? Why, why is there growing? I can definitely and, chime in. Yeah. Why, <laughs> why, why is there more rapid frustration between every single rediscovery that happens? Unlike puny codes, where at the beginning of the year, and we'll probably talk about that. The, the discovery um, was awesome. Everyone was very excited about it. There wasn't any frustration. And then you move into like Lanaji or even Ether ID or, or a mortal player character. Uh, you immediately have a ton of people just fudding it immediately. I think what it does at the core is, and this was like maybe back like whenever Leo did his first timeline, um, mm -hmm. you know, August last year, July last year, whenever. Um, and it was like, what you started to get the feeling of all of us were getting this idea that, Oh, or maybe Harry BTC did this first one. And it's like, somebody maybe asked on Twitter is like, how many do you think there are in 2018? And I was like a lot, right? Like hundreds possibly. And what it does is it gives you this idea like, Oh, maybe these aren't as scarce. Right. Um, and with lineage, especially it's like, well, it's infinite mint. Oh boy, here we go. You know, what does this mean now? Right. <laughs> um, and, you know, for all of us, it's like, oh, there's a dilution of interest, dilution of projects. You know, if somebody tomorrow discovered, oh, wow, in 20, you know, 15, there's, you know, all, you know, another hundred projects. It's like, oh, shoot. Right. It dilutes all of our bags. And we all understand that. And so I think there's that. I mean, I, I think at the core, that's what it is. It's just this idea of like, oh, shoot, there's another 2017, you know. Um, it just doesn't make yours as special, right? Like 2016, there's Pixel Map, right? If you throw a few more projects in there, it doesn't make Pixel Map as special, right? It is still special, but it doesn't make it as special, right? We all want to have, be the bell of the ball and be the only unique magical one, right? But when we realize, oh, there were other people doing stuff too, it just takes away a little bit from you. And I think, you know, we all feel that naturally as humans. Um, but I don't know. I've, I've gotten comfortable with it because I've been, I've been a direct recipient of a lot of this hate. Um, but the reality is it's like, okay, then we are not going to talk about it. And then we're going to talk about it when in another 10 years, we're going to rediscover this one and talk about it. Then is that better? Like, I think it's better to have them all kind of on the table now or as close to now as possible. Yeah, no, no freaking kidding. Who knew that history was uh, inflationary? <laughs> <laughs> Irish guy, how about you? Do you have do you have any thoughts about uh, the rediscovery process? Do you do you enjoy it? Do you see anything wrong with it, um, or just any any sort of um, any sort of relation to it um, that you'd like to express? 
Yeah, I've I've gotten yeah a lot of there's a lot of hate over the use of rappers. Um, rappers definitely because like I, without even like naming any projects or anything, because there's a lot of projects that have been rediscovered because of the rappers, and then have obviously they're able to to market it better. Let's say by using a game you have to rap like there's a utility as to why certain projects should rap as well it's not just it's not just for for to look better or to like change a background color a lot of a lot of projects have use as to why you should rap um the nf the nft and the reason why i think there's a lot of like hysteria there's a lot of uh, issues with, with the rapper is because like should you be including the rapper in like as like a new project should you be into like in, integrating it then within just one like it's it's hard to have like definite like there's always going to be gray areas whether something is even like something should be included like should we include everything um probably like probably not uh, if you if you want to be like if you want to be um very i suppose like if there's if there's people obviously then that are counting exactly how many projects should you only be counting those that are active should you only be you know there, there's mm-hmm. so many different gray areas there like in a way it, it shouldn't matter i suppose if it's if the community is active because as adam said it can always be rediscovered at some point over if it's a brand that yeah just changes their their pfp that can literally just you know explode then because of like let's say a tv ad some sort of marketing and yes it can explode so yeah it's it's, it's difficult to 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 be counting every single one right now at the moment i think you would just be counting those that have some sort of impact um if they were yeah if they were the first project to do pixel art if they were the first project um to to do a certain thing but yeah, we, we don't have, I suppose, the the resources as well. We don't have the time to be looking into it, whether or not all these communities are necessarily like active. Um, and not everyone is going to want to change the look and feel of like a lot of people, let's say, um, that had um the like the the crypto punks, um, they didn't want like they didn't want to change um like so if you have the like like original crypto punk like when you claimed it back in 2017 when it was free to claim and then there was the bug a lot of people wanted to keep that like um and and didn't want to didn't want to wrap it even though they knew that there's a wrapper there because i suppose the untouched can be valued even more than in the future it's the same with like trading cards it's like you don't want to touch something to change it you don't want to alter it you don't want any modification and i can like I can understand that point of view as well. So yeah, there's there's, there's a lot to um to get into, <laughs> a lot to unravel. I mean, it, it's so you know for for all the people who call anybody who does a rediscovery or or brings something forward and calls them a scammer or whatever. I think you were, we were back on the last one you were on there, Jake, mm-hmm. and you were showing, you know, the early days of relaunches and rediscoveries, and it was like um, you know, I'm looking at Mooncats and Curio and Etheria, all projects that. You know, any historical NFT collector uh, probably has some of those in their bag, right? Those are all ones that were like, we love these ones. My moon cat's my forever cat, Mm -hmm. right? There's no more passionate community than an Ethereum community, right? (laughs) These are the ones, right? But go one earlier, right? Crypto cats. How many people are in that Discord right now? Mm -hmm. I think I'm the only one, (laughs) right? Crypto cats are there, right? But the community never really formed. The dev basically shut it down immediately was like these will not and got them banned from open sea there was no way to trade them right and so that happened that community didn't form was that a scam like of course not like that was legit that was a legit rediscovery right but the community didn't form around it um and so be it before whatever reason and it was in my opinion, it was a, a because of the devs kind of shut it down and it lost traction very quickly and then it ended, right? But was that a scam? It was no more a scam than any of those others right there. And those ones are considered legit historical NFTs forever, ever, right? I, I guess um, the like so, the question yeah, that Jake was asking about like the um like what makes it what has made some of these newer dis- discoveries 
controversial or, or drawn ire is um, is that, you know, like you're talking about like moon cats and crypto cats and curio cards and Etheria. I mean, those were all like what we would consider fair launches, right? You know, and like you helped out with 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 Pixel Map too. And then that was probably like the, the first one I remember where we have, you know, someone go in and try and bot it, right? Yeah. And then ever since then, all of these, almost every rediscovery is you know, botted to hell. So I think that's like, it's actually the, it's actually how the relaunch is done, like drives a lot of it too, you know? Sure. Right. So, so Although people would say Mooncast was botted too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh I got, yeah. I got, I got Thirty some odd failed transactions. Oh boy. Uh, the test to Mooncat got botted as well. <laughs> yeah. Well, the the bots is really like what left a hundred and something of those uh, Genesis cats uh, on the moon because they knew they were all going to get botted. But yeah, it, it brings up a good point that as we we're kind of touching on this in the very beginning of bringing some of those modern NFT principles over to the historical community. And that's kind of how some of these relaunches have gone and they haven't always been fair. Um, I mean, it depends on what chain it is, um, which also this kind of leads into uh, probably something a lot of people like to hear. And one of the, the biggest um, crutches of controversy within the historical community is surrounding name coin and um, fair launches. And is it a token? Right. And this kind of leads also into, to wrapping, uh, Full disclaimer, Adam and I work for Emblem Vault, so we're going to touch on Emblem Vault here for, for a second. Uh, Emblem Vault uh, is a technology that essentially allows you to wrap in a different form of way some of these uh, non-EVM assets from Bitcoin, Namecoin, Doge Party, Mona Party, and so on and so forth. And so we did have a fair launch here with with the Puny Codes discovery uh, devoted in that community. I think they only claimed about 2 to 3% of the like 3000 or something assets at the time. And there didn't seem to be that big of an issue around Namecoin until maybe a few months later, um, people started pointing out some of the, these technicalities of is the value in the registry is the value in the token. If the token expires, is it the same token? Therefore does, does the value um, still exist there? Um, Emblem Vault uh, helped bring this, kind of to the mainstream audience of the historical NFT community. Um, and it has the um, the auto renewal feature, which um, has had some bugs, but um, is now fixed. Uh, I wanted to bring this to Zero G as somebody who's uh, who owns a day one NFT. I think you own some early puny codes as well. Um, what's what's your thought about Namecoin? What, what is... Can you explain to those who maybe are unfamiliar with the controversy, what what is the main philosophical divide um, between some of the people in the community that surround Namecoin? It really revolves around the the fact that, you know, Namecoin doesn't operate like later chains do in, in order to to like trade ownership of of assets. The assets are different and the way that the way that it operates is different. So people are People are focusing on the UXTO instead of the resource that that's actually uh, granting access to or permission to or ownership of. So I think that's really the deal. I mean, if you wanted to get hyper technical, you know, for for like for all of the name coin stuff, you'd probably want to say, you know, digital collectible or something because the token isn't like in this case, the token isn't isn't the art. It's not actually it. It's just what gives you access to it. So, um, you know, I I mean, I think a lot of people are th it's threatened a lot of their bags. But at the end of the day, I think Namecoin is legit, um, and I I believe that the these UXTOs that people are able like when you re when you renew an asset, that's just giving you access to it. It's not that's obviously not that because you, you can block explore. And you know those domains and all of the records that are that are updated there live forever as long as Namecoin the chain itself lives. So I don't know how you could pretend like it doesn't exist anymore, right? And when you renew that, you also like you're also given access to uh, to own and update those existing records. Like when you renew a domain, you 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 take over the the current state as it is, right? So there's nothing's lost. So anyway, I, I think it's something that we'll just have to see. It'll take a while, I think, for people to come around to that. I think eventually people will see it my way. 
if they don't, that's okay. I, I value it myself. So if, if other people don't want to, that's, that's okay too. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I pulled up the, the puny codes. It's kind of like a cheat sheet explaining what it is. It, I think it rocks kind of the paradigm of some of the traditional thinking um, to valuing some of the assets, which kind of goes through this like idea of token provenance, contract provenance, uh, the, the complete timestamp. Uh, again, Irish guy was t- kind of talking about like this purity kind of idea of the token. And here it becomes more of, yeah, a pure collectible. It's the one of the, the, early, the earliest altcoin. Um, some things that people like to um, ascribe value to is the idea that uh, Vitalik mentioned it in the Ethereum white paper as a non-fungible asset. Satoshi um, was in the Bitcoin talk forum discussing the idea of forking Bitcoin for some people. That for myself was like the, the big uh, signifier of value. And then you get some of these the, these claims of you know is it is our puny codes art which are decoded, uh, sim, or it's a decoded message that puts out like emojis and symbols and some of the things down here, and then the the discovery process at the time was a fair probably one of the fairest or the fairest probably since Mooncats at the time or one of them, uh, and you kind of put that all together and you kind of create this this community um, and then other people are very uh, antagonistic to it. Um, it was so, almost like a, a proof of work uh, relaunch because you actually had to put in work to go get mm-hmm. a puny code. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't like you just clicked mint or buy or get or whatever. It was like you had to, you know, download your Electrum wallet. You had to like ask devoted for some name coin. <laughs> like it was a little bit of a proof of work relaunch. It was actually awesome. I I, I love that that relaunch. I mean, I, I guess the other thing I'd say too is that you know a lot of a lot of people are really antagonistic to named coin in general. Um, but I, I think it deserves, even if you don't think that tokens have any, or the, you know, digital collectibles or domain, domains, even if you don't believe those have any value, I think named coin deserves a lot of respect. This is the first platform that'll enable this digital like ownership that we're all like, we're all playing with right now. I mean, so I don't know. I, I, I think it's kind of short sighted for to see people just uh fudding on like name coin like as a technology. I mean this yeah. again it, it's cool and it works. I mean the fact it's still here running in twenty twenty two is also pretty amazing too. It is. It has emerged mining, so it is actually probably one of the most secure blockchains out there. I think a controversial point, and we kind of discuss on this with crypto schools, is that um some people try to try to fud it because some of the early excavators claimed like a massive supply, right? It's kind of similar with, with crypto schools oh, yeah. that happened with, uh, with, yeah. with, with Leonidas as well. Um, and then you had the blockheads and then Twitter eggs, um, which are some of the, the earliest, you know, avatars that were registered to a blockchain. Um, they, yeah, I mean, for me, that's, that's the kind of biggest negative about, you know, the Twitter eggs and, uh, you know, the mangas and so, and just to be clear, like I bought a mango like last week or mm-hmm. whatever. Um, so I, my bags are I have bags <laughs> in, the, in the realm. Um, but, and I think that was for me, one of the huge negatives as well, right? Basically one or two guys went in and swept all of the kind of interesting things, mm-hmm. um, which was a, it's a bummer, you know, but I mean, gonna, I mean, that's, that's the way some people this. approach their, you know, rediscoveries, buy everything and then sell into it. Right. Um, well, I- I think it's part of the story though, because that's like, that's one reason why Namecoin in all essence failed as a, as a decentralized DNS project. Cause they like their economic model and their anti-squatting thing, that, that whole system is broken. Right. Mm-hmm. Like you said, Adam, like there's, there's cats that have like more than 10% of all the, you know, all the interesting stuff. So it's, it's super jacked in that distribution. Yep. Yeah. I think if, for some collectors um, and, I, to this point, most name coin things haven't got like a ton of value. Um, for me, how I even like acquired Jake.bit was I had to go to Jake, D slash Jake, then I had to find the guy's email and then I had to f- manage to convince him that there wasn't much attention here before to get it for 200 name coin. And then he went and claimed my ad, or ID slash Jake Gallon because he was very upset about it. Uh, so it's kind of the, it's kind of the story, right? It's like something that I'll never probably sell. Um, but it's more of just a, a pure collectors. And uh, 
I think some of, some of the, the issues that surround it too is some people just like to collect shit, right? I was a collector before I even, before I got into NFTs, there's a bunch of stuff you can even see behind me in this video that I collect that just has no pure value outside of just, uh, just some sort of nostalgia or some sort of like personal relationship, relationship to me. And I think that's something that's oftentimes overlooked um, as well. I mean, to Zero G's point, the importance of, of Namecoin and these early name coin experiments, you can't discount it. These were absolutely critical in the history of NFTs. And so whether they have much value or little value, wh whatever, you know, that's for collectors to kind of decide upon. Um, but but their importance in the history of NFTs is undeniable. Yeah, it, it really absolutely is. I'm excited. So then I guess now where we are, um, I like to call some, I, ca I like to call this phase two, and I discussed this probably at like some point during uh, the summer, that historical NFTs are kind of moving now into uh, phase two. Uh, phase one of 2021 was really just individuals finding these assets and finding communities. And now we're kind of moving into these communi the communities of form. Some of the leaders and in all the individual communities um, have stepped up. And now it's time for the communities to come in and build things, right? This is kind of what led to Adam and I working and moving to to Emblem Vault to build this marketplace, to build more infrastructure. Uh, we've seen some of these websites pop up. We, we now, we have this pretty much a professionalized form of rediscovery where somebody launches the Twitter, you have the Discord, you have all the information laid out. What other things are we missing as a community um, that needs to either mature or needs to even pop up into fruition um, so that we can move into phase three and kind of be side by side some of these more recognized, we'll just call them categories like music NFTs or the metaverse or PFPs or, or anything of that nature. I mean, I'm really astounded that no one's already taken the taken the ring to do that. I mean, we always um, we always I always rip on OpenSea for for what they do and not do. I mean, I'm really astounded they don't have that. And same with all these other marketplaces. It's ridiculous. I, I mean, I think it's kind of ironic that um, Emblem with with is going to end up being the first to do it right. You know, kind of in a, a circuitous way. I mean, so I don't know. It's it's really strange. I I don't get it. But I'm hoping that that changes in the, in the future. How about Irish Irish guy? What are what are your thoughts on it? What uh, what type of infrastructure or what do you think the community is missing that some of these other prominent NFT categories possesses? Yeah, I remember signing something. Um, I think it was Lee and I that shared it about a category being categorized on each marketplace as the year or even historical let's say because realistically it can have every single year going on until like inf infinity but um yeah it would be nice to get some sort of i suppose even if it's a tag if it's for seo purposes or something like this we need like extra i, sp I suppose just like easier features to find not necessarily only use ether scan like everyone uses what revoke.cash for instance instead of using each scan why because it's easier we need more like ease of access to find shit basically um and marketplaces at the moment is the way forward to communicate with to make sure that they can provide more features for artists like let's say um when i first joined nfts about two years ago um and to try and look for an artist to buy even, let's say, photography work was impossible. You just have to like search through, it's like going into a charity shop. You just don't know what you're going to find. Um, you hope you're going to find something good. But yeah, you, sometimes you're disappointed because it is there, but you just can't find it. It's such a pity. Um, and here it's, it's, it's things that will evolve over time. No doubt about that. Like the UX design is already improving on like ledger devices now. But yeah, we we need we need definitely I think to communicate more with um, teams um, that are building at the moment, and I hate to say the word build, but it, it's very true because right now <laughs> is the perfect time. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's it, marketplaces. Honestly, from even a discovery standpoint, I don't think marketplaces are the are the are the way we discover stuff as humans. Um, I think we discover stuff through the people we follow or, you know, whatever media we're consuming. That's actually the way 
we discover stuff, but it's the the marketplace, and this is obviously what we're hoping to solve with that with Emblem Vault is to make it kind of dummy proof. There, you can't screw it up. So if I'm looking for a Nakamoto, I land on a Nakamoto, and I can't land on any sort of fake scammy Nakamoto, right? Like that's the thing that marketplaces have to really solve, and none of them have solved it right now. It's you know, it's 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 bad. Um, but to that point, we need again, it's just more creators to create. And I think like old NFT, I don't think it gets enough love. Like mm-hmm. that, that was really big. I think it really created a really nice interface. Um, where it's like, oh no, this is a really good start. Like, and this just needs to be done at scale, right? This just needs to be more of this. And uh, you know, that's just time and effort, right? And we'll get there. But like punch in old NFT on Google or whatever, like it's like it just needs to be more and in more places and more touch points so that, you know, people can find this stuff. But he did a really nice job and and shout out to him. Yeah, this is absolutely incredible. I kind of documented this um, in part three that you start in the calendar. You start seeing some of these infrastructure plays. You see uh, the Japanese NFTs website, old NFT there's uh, there was the NFT archaeology thing that Ken did. There was the NFT timeline, um, some more timelines, and then trying to bring it together. And then recently we had uh, Leonidas. He brought up the uh, is the the NFT wiki, which is also something that's I think going to uh, be very popular. Um, which is all just these are all personal entries um, of just a wiki. Like having something like this is just just crucial. You could come in and click on any type of information and see the history. Um, so that's what we need. Of course, Av and I, we work for uh, Emblem Vault. And I think this is going to be something crucial to just, uh, you know, shamelessly shill some bags and kind of what we're working on. This to me is going to, it, it, as long as it proves, the technology proves to be, to be uh, good, the ability to have things like rare Pepe's and spells of Genesis and Saratobi and some of the, the counterparty or some of the Doge party assets, and then eventually moving to curated collections for Namecoin and some of these other ones and having them sit right here um, within the open sea top 100 collection, I think is going to be very crucial because it's going to bring a lot of uh, attention and discovery to these different projects. And then when you think about just, Pepe's pure size of 1,774 different collections. It's hard to not think about it just being a consistent top collection as long as people in the community are participating. Of course, you do have the other the other side where you have counterparty maximalists or Bitcoin maximalists who don't want to engage in anything Ethereum, right? They they believe in self-sovereignty and uh, bringing their chain or keeping their assets on the native chain, which is definitely fine. It's more secure. Um, but there are these trade-offs, um, that have to happen. And it, it's kind of just, again, bringing, circling back to the very beginning of taking some of these modern principles that exist within the, or these principles and trends that exist in the modern NFT space and bringing them to historical communities, um, where they're not necessarily, where the users aren't necessarily, uh, persistent on decentralization. They just want permissionless uh, more than more than anything itself. So I think that's something good to look out for um, in in the the Pepe space, or I guess the Emblem Vault in, in infrastructure. And then I think the the marketplace tends to come a little bit afterwards, um, and then just some more charts and more things like that. Um, I yeah. think like we're gonna see a lot more as well with like multi-chain so we're gonna need that as well to sh- to be very uh transparent if it's only on one chain or if it's yeah if it's on more than one because like even with crypto skulls um was a po- um polygon do you know polygon as well as ethereum not a lot of people even know that people just assume if it's ethereum then it's only ethereum and i think we need to broaden that uh, not that knowledge, but that kind of space a little bit more as well, because I think the future will be multi-chain. I think like when I first um, started NFTs, I said, I'll only be sticking with Ethereum because it will always be just Ethereum is like the most popular right now. But we don't know if it's always going to be like that. So why would like if you're open, open minded enough to invest in crypto that, you know, could go to zero tomorrow? 
why wouldn't you also try out other blockchains, you know? So I think people need to, again, it's the same with like people's PFP, they get so attached. Um, so I think we need to like kind of take a step back a little bit more, be a little bit more open-minded to other communities and other blockchains, I think, and it will benefit everyone, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think this is kind of the majority, and I'll let Zero G go right after this. I think this is kind of where the historical NFT community kind of has a little bit of advantage because the the majority of the collectors in the HNFT space are already dabbling in multi-chain, as we mentioned with Dogecoin and Emmercoin and Namecoin and Bitcoin. Um, there are, of course, the the absolutists, they're the technical maxis, I guess is what you want to call it, which is completely okay. But I think that the heavy majority is already dabbling in this. I guess it's then moving and getting crypto schools on Solana to sell, right? Or bringing Pepe's to Tezos uh, is something that'll be a, a massive benefit. And I think philosophically, our communities are already at that advantage. And go ahead, Zirji. I was just going to say, I mean, kind of like something that that Adam touched on is that, you know, um, even if you choose not to not to keep them long term in, in emblem, the fact that like giving it a an easy option where you can just give someone a link where they know that they're actually not going to get scammed on um, on these without having to learn the intricacies of of emblem, because, you know, for for someone who's not super technical or just hasn't really studied it a lot. It it can be really intimidating at first. And if they're just like getting hyped up and they want to, you know, they want to go buy a UFO Pepe or something, you know, it would be horrible to see them, you know, like get, get rooked by one of those old scams, you know? So I think just having like a, you know, a known trusted link that that can be on all of these different, you know, you know, discords and whatnot. I don't know. I think that that's really positive and it can only help going forward. I mean, you just scrolled past Curio or whatever, and it's like I'm reminded, like in the Curio Discord, like I'm got my Curio 26 on, right? It's like the this is the thing about like even the simplest thing like Curios, you still get the questions to this day, like what are the what, why are there two wrapped Curio when I punch in Curios? Why are there two wrappers, mm -hmm. right? And what you know what people get confused, they don't know, right? This is how early we are. The people have to like kind of learn all this stuff. Um, so keep simplifying that to the to the masses to the next group, um, I, I think it's critical. Yeah, absolutely agree as well. And uh, so so I know we are coming up on, on time. I also wanted to pull up NFT relics um, because they have the the NFT relics uh, explorer, which I think is just a, a massive massive tool um, that is underutilized, um, where it it uh, it aggregates the different assets uh, from. They have the Namecoin and Emmercoin Explorer, but if you click here, you could filter by project and you can see all these uh, counterparty collections, which you know gives you the floor price and everything like that. Uh, I did want to do an end round table for those that, um, so that those that are listening or watching could hear. Um, what are some uh, collections to either look out for and uh, what are some of your favorite assets or maybe grail assets that, you know, can either be super popular um, or maybe some some under uh, some undervalued or uh, some overlooked uh, assets? Uh, we'll start with uh, Zero G. I mean, I, I I have to say one of my favorites is is Rare Pepe's and, and the Nakamoto Pepe in particular. I think it's interesting that even within this bear market, We've, it seems like we've already started to see it diverge from the rest of the what we consider grails, um, even though it has a, a larger supply than a lot of them. So I think it's really interesting to watch and see if that continues. This we may actually be starting to see this one make make the first major divergence, you know, and become uh, really bust loose, you know. So I think that's interesting. But um, in terms of other projects, I think are. Um, you know, I love rare Pepe's. Fake rares are, are really cool too. Um, I mean, there's so many. There's just, I guess, what I would just say is, um, you know, I mean, just dig in. There's so many like awesome projects. You know, find what you love and and jump in. Yeah, I agree. Pepe's really have started to to catch their own heat uh, from the modern NFT space and just overall, they're really starting to get there. Again, I've said this a million times, but I think Pepe's are really just the final boss of NFTs. There's, I, to me, they sit right alongside CryptoPunks. They just have a much larger supply. So the the accumulation period is gonna be much, much larger or much, much longer um, until it reaches that like breakaway speed that, that Punks uh, possessed. Uh, how about you, Irish Gal? What are 
some some of your favorite collections and uh, favorite assets that you either own or are looking at or you just appreciate? You know what? One thing I am sick of looking at is rare peppers. <laughs> <laughs> I actually see them just every single day. I, I mean, it's like crypto folks, you see them everywhere. But um, um, one that I like in terms of the art and the community, and now it might be because I'm an animal lover, is um doggies um the dog doggies nft um i was introduced to them by a v1 punk community member and they're just doing a lot in terms of like actively responding to the community listening to feedback they developed a rapper they developed like a second collection um where it's like ba- baby dogs and um i think it's really cool what they're doing um but yeah um there is a there is a lot i mean you could talk all day about like i i wouldn't say i have one like favorite as such because i'd be biased if i'm if i say like obviously crypto scroll v1 funks but like yeah i think i think it's it's nice to be involved in multiple historical nft projects and i think a lot of collectors are not just involved in just one historical community you see people they get addicted and, but it's a good it's a good addiction because you're making friends along the way. So any I think any community that you join and straight away you're getting better engagement online or you're you're after like finding someone that's like local in your community that you can meet up with in person, then it's a great community to to join. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Uh, the Doogies community. Probably the dankest memes um, between Best that memes and in yeah, the business. yeah, virtual, virtual Alaska is uh, quite a quite a great troll, uh, quite hilarious. So if you listen to that, that shout, awesome, shout, shout out to you. Uh, how, about, how about you, Adam? I mean, of course, you got a curio card uh, shirt on. Um, what are your what are your favorite collect uh, collections, or what are some things that are maybe overlooked? Well, I think to um, the Irish gal's point, the idea of connecting with a community. Um, if you don't have much money and look, I started with, like I've told the story, like half an ETH, right? If, if you're one of those guys who has just a few hundred dollars and want to be involved in the space, I think that's actually a decent strategy is find a community that's, um, you know, inexpensive that you can get in and that you can provide value. And whether that's, you know, doing memes or just engaging, uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity in the historic NFT space. Even if you don't consider Dogie's, you know, historic NFTs, like you can get a crypto card for, you know, 30 bucks or, you know, even curios, you can get curios for a hundred bucks or something. You can join those communities. Um, but from a, a value standpoint and a collector, like I'm, I'm certainly no expert, uh, but I do know that communities like Pepe's, like I'm fully green pilled, like everybody talking here. Right. But I also know that with 1700 different ones, it's almost going to be impossible for anyone to dive through that. So the value is going to kind of accrue exponentially to the most relevant pieces in those collections. And obviously Nakamoto is the one most people on earth can't afford, it, <laughs> right? but that's going to be the one, like, is it going to be, you know, exponentially valued more highly than the second card that came out, whatever the Mount Gox card, probably right i hold the mount gox card because i probably never afford a nakamoto right (laughs) but i'm never going to see the kind of outsized returns most likely because everybody's going to know the nakamoto and that's kind of the same you know across a lot of these these kind of things for whatever reason right um so if you can get get it together and you believe in a certain kind of project or whatever i would look to to get the one that's going to be the most well known you know try to do that if you are a collector, um, that seems like the best strategy. I could be wrong, but that just seems like the way it's going to go is like, there are a lot of projects. Uh, it's really hard to get attention. So kind of focusing on like the alpha of any particular project seems like a decent strategy. Yeah, I agree. I think now that we've been doing this for Mars will be two, two years at this point, a lot of the, the ultra girls are really either taken and held on to or have become um, kind of out of price. I mean, even with 96 Genesis Mooncats, they're still sitting at about a 30 ETH floor, right? That's still at this point, forty, fifty thousand $50,000. That's out of, out of the reach for some people. Uh, of course, uh, Mooncats are my favorite. Of course, very, very biased. It ha- does have the largest community, uh, pretty low entry floor. Curio cards are a good one. 
uh, with, with Namecoin, I think Puny Codes is pro- is a pretty solid community. You could get in low. Uh, Spells of Genesis is something that um, is oftentimes overlooked um, as being the first real gaming collection. Um, but it's also starting to get out of reach of people too, right? The the early cards are now one ETH or more. For some people, yeah. that's that's a lot. It's still a lot of money, right? If you're working a, a regular wage job. So that I think that's kind of what happened over this last year is a lot of these people started getting priced out, um, especially when ETH was, you know, three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000. They started moving down the timeline, um, trying to think three, four years ahead where most of the other collectors who got in early were thinking in 2017 terms or 2015 terms. Uh, I think we do have a bright future ahead. It does seem like people are starting to move in. Uh, words of advice for, for everyone, though, is just to be a little bit, have a little bit softer touch for people who are trying to enter the space. I mean, there's a lot of NFT influencers or, or just interested parties who try to come into the space and, you know, they, they post their own infographic or their own interest and they just get completely bombarded by, (laughs) by, by, by hate and, and people saying, yeah, fatality. (laughs) No, this is the first NFT. No, this is the first crypto collectible full set of 32. Right. And it just becomes, (laughs) it just becomes, it becomes so ultra niche and uh, it becomes so cringe at times where I was part of that camp. I I do admit it. I've definitely backed off on it and tried to be a, a, a little bit nicer to people because it is a lot to dive through, especially when the, the, the information is distributed across 10, 15, 20 different websites and 100 different Twitter accounts. So uh, I'm excited for, for what comes next. And uh, yeah, thank you guys for, for coming on and having this conversation. I think uh, we really covered a lot um, and I hope we provided some information, some insight to those that are listening who want to enter the space. Um, We'll start with Irish Gal. Uh, where can everybody reach you? And uh, any final closing comments on the historical space of 2022? Yeah, we don't want it to be a war, especially for for new people joining. We want it to be as welcome as, as possible. Uh, that's why I'm trying to focus right now on like education um, in the space. Um, and I don't think anyone is, you know, necessarily like an expert at, at anything in, in the NFT space where you can all learn from each other. So I think, yeah, I, I, I definitely agree. Even if it's 1% nicer, but you, you know, even if you, you don't think you're a nice human being, you can always be a little bit nicer. So yeah, definitely. Um, everyone can catch me on um, Crypto School's Discord and on any social media platform. Literally, I'm on them all. Uh, Irish NFT gal, it should be the same. Hey, how about you, Zero G? Um, I've got a YouTube channel that's linked in my um, Twitter profile um, and uh, exploring the vintage NFT space. And um, I've also, uh, I wanted to show uh, my latest uh, new fake rare Pepe, they live Pepe. So (laughs) yeah, you can find me on Twitter and Discord and YouTube and all that stuff. So yeah, I love I love the the fake rare. It has a historical NFT emphasis on it and shows shows some collections. Um, and it's cool. To just shout out to fake rares for, um, you know, they have the they they use Counterparty, the historical uh, platform. They're related to Rare Pepe, some of the same community, but they are doing a really good job. Maybe the best job right now of bringing in some of the newer crowd into the historical space. Um, so glad you're participating and love what they're doing. And uh, we'll end over here with Adam. It's so interesting. And I, I always appreciate people trying new things like, like zero G is doing. And, you know, all the stuff we're talking about is, was people just exploring and trying new stuff. And so I encourage people to just keep doing that. Right. Cause web three can't be built without people trying and building new stuff and failing and trying again. And and part of what we has been so awesome about rediscovering projects and talking about these rediscoveries is telling the stories about what people were building, right? Um, it's product, part of the awesomeness of it. And um, I encourage that. So anybody who wants to to join uh, and help us tell these stories, uh, always welcome. You can find me on Twitter. My DMs are always open. Yeah, Adam is there. Yeah. Uh, one, one cool part is a lot of these uh, dev teams and creators, they have a, a second chance because they were too early just exploring. Uh, now that the, the money has uh, came in and the attention 
Um, they also deserve some credit as well. So thank you all of you guys for, for joining. Uh, have a great and happy new year. Um, I know I'll probably see you on Twitter uh, immediately after this uh, as well. So uh, those who are uh, listening, watching, thank you guys for joining. Join the historical community. Reach out to any of these individuals. Listen to the shows. Like, comment, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And uh, we will see you next year.